It's an honour to be here this morning. There's nothing I like better than to preach God's word. It gives me great joy and it gives me life. So thank you, Menai, for the opportunity. Mind you, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? I've tried a few times (laughs) and something always happens, but I'm really grateful. Let's just invite God into this sacred space. Father God, we know that you're already here. We don't actually have to invite you in, but we just want to be open to you. We want our eyes to see and our hearts to feel and our ears to hear. So Father, will you just speak through your word to our hearts today. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm only preaching from one verse today. I know that sounds great. (laughs) Yeah, you got it. (laughs) It's all right. If uh, Steve goes to sleep, that's the time that I have to stop talking, okay? And if Matt goes to sleep, I'm out of here. All righty. I'm preaching from um, Revelation 3.20, which is one of our verses for the week from Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And I've chosen this verse um, because I've been to where it talks about. So the church is Laodicea. And if you know anything about Revelation, which I don't, but it's got seven letters to the churches in it. And the church at Laodicea is modern day Pamukkale. And you will remember the beautiful springs at Pamukkale. There's nothing like it if you've been on the footsteps um, of Paul Journey. But this is one of the letters to the churches in in early Revelation. You will know or you probably know that uh, John was on exile on the island of Patmos uh, in a cave and he was given these revelations from God to write down. And so we need to take seriously Jesus' words to the church. So the seven letters... And this one is, as I said, to the church of Laodicea. And he accuses them of being not hot, not cold, but lukewarm. Not hot, not cold, but lukewarm. Maybe a foot in both camps, maybe either side of the fence, but absolutely useless because they're not one or the other. Not hot, not cold, but lukewarm. Even before this verse that we're going to look at, see I haven't even got to the verse yet. (laughs) Before he um, comes to that verse, he actually says he's ready to spit them out of his mouth. That's how anguished Jesus' heart is for this church. Now I want to remind you today This verse, Revelation 3.20, is most often used as a salvation verse. But it's not. It's a holiness verse. It's a Christ-likeness verse. It's a verse given to the church. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation this morning. Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. This is a church. I'm standing at the door knocking. We could just stay on that for the next hour. I'm standing at the door knocking. In the Jewish culture, a bride would stand at home behind her door. And when the bridegroom and his father came to get his bride, he would bring a cup covenant cup and he would bring the bride price and the the tradition was they would knock on the door and if the bride opened the door that was her yes and if she didn't I guess they went home again and so this picture of knocking on a door is about covenant relationship it's about a love relationship it's about how serious are you living your life with me for the rest of your life And Jesus is standing at the door of our hearts going, knock, knock. Will you let me in? Now, I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. 
that Jesus would have to stand at the church door and knock to get in. What's even worse is if he has to stand at the door of our heart and knock to get in. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, if, if you will open the door within. You see, there's no handle on the other side. Jesus can't open it. He gives you the free will and me the free will to invite him in. Now, when I invited him in when I was eight years old, did I really know what I was doing? I certainly wanted Jesus in my heart, but but did I know what that would mean? And did I know how to live a life like that? No, I didn't. But you see, the door is the entryway, is it not? And beyond the door is a whole house, many, many rooms, And over my life journey, and I'm sure over yours, Jesus gets a a bit more and another room and another room and another room until we are totally and utterly surrendered to him. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, here is the promise. I will come into you and feast with you and you will feast with me. Now, the NIV said eat. I love the word feast, especially if it's a whole lot of chocolate. This is my worst nightmare feast. <laughs> that's, that's why Matt and Ash just laughed when they saw it. <laughs> the only thing worse would be if it was rabbit food, for obvious reasons. But how often do you and I settle for a feast of this? Spiritually speaking, what do we spend the most time eating? We grab a biscuit on the way out, a crumb in the car, maybe nothing at all. But Jesus says, I will come in to you. How cool is that? This is the great creator God we're talking about. I will come in to you. I will come to you. And I will feast with you and you with me. How can you not accept that kind of invitation? So you can have a biscuit or a crumb or less. Sorry, there's the crumb. Or you can have a feast with Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. When you look at it like that, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? And yet how often do we settle for less? The reason Jesus called the church of Laodicea lukewarm was because they were neither hot nor cold, as we've said. But they were a very rich church, a very wealthy church. They had a special eye ointment, they had textiles, they had finances, and they were very rich. And so they were very, very independent, very self-sufficient and very proud. And those are the things that stopped them from inviting Jesus into their heart, into their life, into their church. They didn't need him. Sound familiar? Our world is like that today, isn't it? The world doesn't need him. Mr. Putin doesn't need him. Lots of people don't need him and we see the results of actions when people don't need God. But you know what? How often do you and I put up the, don't, the stop sign and don't enter sign? The same Jesus knocking on our church door. And John finishes those verses with saying, the one whose heart is open, to let him come and listen carefully to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Spirit is wanting a church that has an open door to let the Spirit within, to let the Spirit revive, to let the Spirit restore, to let the Spirit take over. And it only comes with surrender. It only comes with humility in saying, you know what, I'm, I'm great at what I do, but boy, do I need Jesus. 
I can't write my spiritual story. I can't write my spiritual life. I can't grow as a Christian by myself. I need God to do that. And so this morning, what are we feasting on? Are we feasting on crumbs? Oh, actually, that really smells nice when you go a bit closer. Must be the strawberries. (laughs) You can have a feast with Jesus or you can have crumbs. Now, I'd like to finish this morning on a personal note. So this is an area of my life that God keeps bringing me back to, normally at the beginning of every year, because I fail so often with it. You know, I do love Jesus and I love him very much. But so often, so often, I just live like I don't. So often. So often I'll go through a day and it's not until I'm in a bind that I remember, oh yeah. I want to share a poem with you that I wrote quite a while ago, about 10 years ago now. And it came on a a time when I was um, confused and I was searching. But I was at a retreat and we were given a day of retreat and we were sent to a cathedral. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? You know, beautiful, quiet cathedral, get close to God, hear him speak. Yeah, they were doing renovations. (laughs) Way up, way up in the belfry, all you could hear was banging, loud banging, all the time, all the morning. Everyone else left and I was the only one left because God said, "Uh, uh, 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 I can speak through anything, you're not moving. There were crowds, people coming through with their cameras, you know. People were lining up for confession at the confession box and it just went on and on and on. I'm getting more frustrated as the seconds go by. But God said to me, are you going to listen to me or the noise? Are you going to hear me or are you going to look at what's happening? And so I sat there. And these are the words that he gave me and I share them this morning only because... I want to share with you that I'm on this journey exactly the same as you and that God comes to my heart and he has to knock to enter too. Sometimes my heart is closed shut and you have to patiently attempt to pry it open and when you can't, you have to go away and try again tomorrow. Sometimes my heart is ajar and you may enter cautiously but you will find no welcome mat laid down to wipe your feet and you go away unmoved. Sometimes my heart is like a crowded marketplace, so many items on offer, all jumbled into one, and there is no throne for you to sit upon, and you linger midst the sweat and noise and wait. Sometimes my heart is darkened by the night, with not even the flicker of a candle to welcome you and you come and be the light and I'm afraid of what I will see and run back fast into the shadows of my soul. Sometimes my heart is cold with indifference to your invitation. Your presence brings no solace for I am lost in careless thought and empty words of apathy. Sometimes my heart is like a fireplace, still warm from last night's fire, and you come and touch the embers there. So the still warm ash leaps into flame, burning, beaming, lighting, heating, warming us both continuously there. Sometimes my heart lies open before you, too fragile to look at who enters there, immersed in pain, broken with grief, shattered through its journey, and yet you come and stay and hold the pieces in your gentle hands and stay. Sometimes my heart is bursting with excitement, ready for the visitor who will pass by here today, joyful in anticipation of the conversation, the love exchanged, the beauty shared, the welcome mat of love and laid gladly there. How rare. Lord, I am so sorry for the many times you came and my heart was closed, indifferent, ajar, crowded, dark, cold or fragile. When the welcome mat has not been laid, 
The loving words have not been said. The open arms were folded in defence. The touch of acknowledgement was left undone. And you have gone away untouched, unmoved, unwelcomed, unloved. Lord, forgive me. Help my heart today and every moment of all my todays to be open, ready, willing, surrendered, listening to welcome your love home. And I only share that because it's just as hard for me to open the door as it is for you. It sounds so easy. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? The crumbs that we, we, we cling to and we look to because they're easy or the amazing feast that God has for us to grow us and to strengthen us and to make us useful to him. It's a no-brainer. So why is it so hard? This morning, as I share those thoughts with you, maybe you can identify with some of those feelings. Sometimes it's scary to open up to God. Other times, we don't need him. Other times, we're just too busy. Other times we couldn't care less. There are so many ways that we treat God because we're human. And yet Jesus stands at the door and continually knocks. He doesn't go away. I recently heard the story of a Salvation Army officer who closed the door on God for 27 years and finally said yes to God to be an officer. God doesn't go anywhere. He's still knocking. And so I just invite you this morning to physically come and take of the feast. I want you to look at what, what you do, as I do sometimes, and just take crumbs from what God has for me. Or can I take something much deeper, much richer? It's all it takes is to let him in, to open the door, to let him in. And he will come in and feast and make us into the person he wants us to be. And so this morning, as Ash plays for us, I invite you, if it will help you today... To say, Jesus, I, I don't want the crumbs anymore. I don't want the, the drive through Maccas anymore. I want the real thing. I want the feast. I want to sit and feast with you. Then I invite you to come. There's plenty of fruit here. I invite you to come and as a symbol today, take some grapes, take a banana or an apple, an orange, strawberry, whatever. Take it. And stand there and eat it and say, I want more of you, God. I want more of you. I want the feast. I want the feast. And you can go home and keep eating the bickies. But I tell you, he'll keep knocking. And every week he will knock and knock and knock until you surrender. Just like he did for my husband. Eventually. Eventually, God gets his man and his woman. And look at the result. God wants to use us. We're just ordinary people, but God wants to use us and make us who he wants us to be. I've also placed some copies of the prayer, of uh, the poem that I used, uh, shared with you, if, if that will help you to pray. Maybe there's a verse in there that helps you. And so they're there on the mercy seats, if that will help you. This is your time between you and God, not me. God is at the door knocking of his church here at Menai. What is the church going to say? What are you going to say? I leave it to you.